What's going on guys? Welcome back to Blues Fans TV. Welcome back to another video outside the beautiful Stamford Bridge. Obviously Sophie Rose isn't here, but we have upgraded. We've got Craig going for a couple of videos for us today. How are you oh, feeling? I'm better looking than I. Oh, definitely. And you know what? We ain't even lost the tits too, so. Oh, you bitch! <laughs> you bitch! I had to drop that, you but yeah. You bitch! Craigo 28 Football, Craigo 28 Sports. Check it out. We're going to leave links down in the description below. Right. And Carefree Lewis G as well, if you guys could. But yeah, we're going to talk about the top five things we've learned from the first six games of the season. And we're going to get through this one by one, but we'll start with the first one. We'll go with Timo Werner. What's your thoughts on him? Should be played more centrally. I'm still not happy with you. <laughs> you're still hurt by it. Yeah, fuck you, man. Am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah, yeah I am. Yeah, it's fine. Done it. Cool. Oh, it's chill. Uh, yeah, Vernon is played down the middle. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's been all right out wide, but I mean, he's nowhere near as impactful as I think people really want him to be. Um, he needs to play down the middle. I think there was a lot of pressure from the Barnsley game where it's like, oh, yeah, Tammy needs to play with Havertz, that link up's great. And I don't necessarily think it, it is really. I just think it, it was. It's a bit because it was Barnsley. Yeah, I, I think it was a bit more because of the opposition. Um, you know, it's a cup tie. They had to go for it, otherwise they're out, you know. So when you are 2 0, 3 0 down, then space opens up, opportunities open up. They were quite good actually going forward, Barnsley. Um, but yeah, now the space was open for Tammy. And I, I, although he definitely is going to have a use for us this season, I don't think starting him and Havertz is absolute must like material. I think Werner playing down the middle will be a lot better for the team as a whole. Um, obviously, yes, injuries have been a little bit of a concern. Um, but, you know, Mount can play out wide on the right-hand side. As much as we don't really love it, he can do it. hudson Adoy can play right on the right-hand side. Pulisic now seems to be back. ZX not a million miles away from being fit again. So, yeah, play Werner down the middle where we actually signed him to play. Do you think it's a case of Werner where he likes starting off in that central position and then roaming in? But if it's a case where he's fixed in that position, he can't really do much? Because that's what I've figured out from the last few games. Um, I, I think that the, a lot of people are banging on about like the interchangeable front three and whatever, that, or front four that we could potentially have with Havertz and, uh, and Ziyech. Yeah, I, I think it, it's going to be nice to see, but I, I, I would want to see Werner more down the middle. I want to see Timo actually attacking people with pace that we've got. You know, Costa came out wide to left-hand side. Torres came out wide to left-hand side. The centre forwards do move. They do come wide every now and again, but it's not an absolute must that they have to you know, start wide and then come in. Just playing in the middle. Look, if, if the game takes you out wide, fine, it does. You know, I'm not going to mean. Even Dominic Calvert-Lewin did it the other day for England. You know, he ended up on the left-hand side and Rashford ended up in the middle. It's all right. It's a good problem to have. But you need to see this guy starting down the middle because 80% of the time you need him to be in the box because he's such a threat that we're not seeing at the moment. Centre-half is going to be so, so worried about him. All right, second point that we're going to go into, and we're going to talk about the Chelsea defence. Now, there was a lot of questions about it last season, and all for fair dues, because it was terrible, organisation was shocking. And we have had our individual mistakes this season. I'm going to throw that disclaimer straight out there. But this defence already looks 10 times better than it already has last season. I think the organisation is a lot stronger. I think we're a lot tougher to break down. The only thing that's kind of holding us back is the individual mistakes. I'll use Liverpool as a key example. Without that red card to Christensen, I guarantee that game stays 0-0, maybe goes 1-0 either side. But we had Liverpool that first half. They were dominating us for large periods. I mean, no one's going to question that. Mm -hmm. But we had the game going in the way that we wanted to. We were coping with Liverpool. Yeah. I think the organisation's got better. Yeah, I, I think also with the Liverpool game, just very quickly mentioning it as well, you know, is last season, we lost them 2-1 very early doors in the season. And people weren't actually, oh, it's a bad result and whatever. You know, we held our own against, obviously, the team to be champions. Now they are champions. You go down to 10 men, it's unfortunate. You lose 2-0. We do miss a penalty as well. It's not actually that bad of a result, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, you, you are right. You know, the game was very much in our hands if we wanted it to be at 0-0. Um, do I think we would have gone on to win the game? I must be honest, no. I don't think we would have. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it completely. Um, I didn't think we'd go and beat Man City uh, last season. And again, it went in our favour, you know, with a, with a penalty, a red card and whatever, breakaway goal. You've got to keep yourself in these games and that's what Chelsea have been doing. Um, yes, the defence has got its problems and uh, we're not going to lie. We're not going to lie and ignore the fact that West Brom happened because um, it did. Um, so I, I think the main thing for me is we've got We've got the talent, we've got the ability, and we've got the communication, which now, now seems like it's obviously perfect. Currently, it's not in English, but, I mean, it, it, it's still... It, works. Yeah, you know, you are right, it is whatever works. Um, Thiago Silva is definitely making an impact, you can see that. Is he going to be the final piece of the puzzle for years to come? No, he's not. Um, but, again, you get two years out of him or so, you go and buy a top centre-half from there, then, yeah, Chelsea are cooking on gas, do you know what I mean? Chilwell looks solid, he looks fine. 
Um, it's only it's a bit annoying that we haven't seen them all play together for more than a couple of games. Um, but you know, Chilwell looks like he's going to be okay. I still think Azpilicueta is the better person to play at right back for now. Um, now yeah. yeah, for right now, I, I think Chelsea need to work on our defensive unit first. Um, and as much as I like Rhys James going forward and scoring goals and getting assists, you know, we do need to be able to defend properly as well. Um, you know, Liverpool. You know, Chris is, I want to throw his name out too. I think he's been excellent for the break. Take the red card out. I think he's yeah. I, I, th I think I think Chelsea have uh, we've identified that Thiago Silva is going to be the guy to, to play most weeks. Um, but then, of course, now we've got a lot of depth at centre half. Obviously, with not pe moving people on, Tamori is still there, Christensen's there, Rudiger's there, Zuma, of course, is there. The likelihood is it's going to be a Zuma and uh, Thiago Silva partnership. Yeah. But I, I, I feel quite comfortable with Christensen coming in, you know, not permanently, but I feel quite comfortable with him coming in and playing game two games, something like that. Um, I, th I think we've got it right. I, I think it's, we've lacked a left back for a long, long time. I think Ben Chilwell is going to be the guy um, that kind of breaks that duct for us. Um, and then from there, we can sort out the centre half pair and we're fine. Moving on to our third point, and we're going to talk about the midfield, the stacked midfield. And there's going to be a lot of people that are unhappy with, I think, whatever mention that we make because there's going to be a quality midfielder that misses out. Yeah. But we need to talk about the midfield pivot because right now I'm seeing three players that could potentially be starting. But I think our player of the season doesn't make it right now. So our third point is that Mateo Kovacic right now doesn't get into our best starting eleven. I think we're both in agreement that the Jorginho Kante pivot has us a little bit more defensively solid. Kante can still do that same role that Kovacic does, but you can't have both of them in the same position. No, you can't have both of them playing together doing the same thing because they're just a little bit too similar. Yeah, I, I think... I think, yeah, you know, as we said, it is a bit more defensively sound. And that's what Chelsea need to work on. You know, last year we scored goals for fun and we're doing it again this year kind of thing, you know. It's, you whacked uh, six against Barnsley, yes, it's Barnsley, I know. You come back and you score three goals against West Brom, Grant, it wasn't from a, uh, uh, it was from a losing position, but you still score three goals against them quite comfortably. You go and whack four past um, Crystal Palace, you know. We can score goals. We can score goals. I think it just has to be the defensive element has to be better for Chelsea. And uh, I'm not, this, is, this is not us knocking Mateo Kovacic yeah. at all. He's a fantastic footballer. Um, but I just think the partnership of Kante and Kovacic doesn't quite work as well as we might have hoped it would. Um, you know, there probably would be certain people that would argue that maybe Kovacic should be sold if he's not going to get in that team. I, I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those people at all. That but you, Yeah, I, I agree. The depth is great. But you could see where the argument would, you know, could potentially be. You've got this great asset that we paid 40 million quid for. Are we going to keep him hanging around? Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but for me, I still think Kovacic has a vital role to play in this team. I think there's a lot of potential for him. Um, and I just think one of the main things that I want to make sure that we do, we're talking about the back four potentially rotating round and the front three and attacking midfielder, you know, rotating round. I want to see that rotation. And there will be certain times that Kante's not the right answer. Kante's not the right person. Um, you know, if you've got to break down a team, is Kante going to be the right person compared to, to Kovacic? I don't think so. Do you know what I mean? So I think you do have to be really quite almost harsh, I suppose you'd say, depending on what the game is. Could a Jorginho and Kovacic pivot work better than a Jorginho and Kante? Could, Only in the right game. Exactly, you know, it is in the right game. Could Kante play a defensive midfield role himself? You know. I think he can, he can get into that. Exactly. But he's not there yet. He's not there yet, no, not at all. That's where I want to see Kante just kind of push a little bit more on. Um, but Kovacic's passing, Jorginho's passing is absolutely brilliant. Um, but just when you have to look at the defensive side of the ball, is that's where Kovacic slightly lacks compared to Jorginho. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's not necessarily putting a foot in. It's not necessarily, you know, winning little, you know, just little tackles, slide tackles. All that. It's not that kind of stuff. It's just the little simplistic things, just keeping the ball. You know, that's defensive work as well. Even if you have the ball, it's still defensive minded to know when the out ball is the right thing to play. I think Jorginho does it a little bit better. And I have to say, I'm not Jorginho's biggest fan. I don't think he's probably worth the money that we spent on him. And I've said this many times before and I'll get a lot of hate for it. I don't really care. But realistic, oh, I know, I know. But realistically, for right now, he's the right person to have. It has to be for me, most weeks, Jorginho and Kante playing as a pivot. One final point as well before we drop this point. The reason why I also agree with that is because you saw with last season we got to deal with a lot of teams that play defensive against us and to struggle to break down teams like that I feel like you need a player like Jorginho 
who can continue to recycle possession, try and find other ways to break teams down. But I feel like we kind of lack that with someone else. Yeah, Jorginho is the guy that if you want to pass left and right, because sometimes in football you do have to, yeah, let Jorginho do it. Let Jorginho do it. You should allow the attacking four, five, whatever you want to call it, to be able to break down people, play forward passes. Um, Jorginho might be able to do it in games, of course, yeah. But where you've got a real problem is with the likes of Callum hudson Adoy, and he's been doing it a lot, where he just kind of cuts back in and passes sideways. And he just kind of absorbs the pressure without us actually doing anything. Jorginho is a lot better at it. He can move the ball from left to right. He can ping it going 30, 40 yards. And the, game, you know, and, and, and the play is still on. You know, We're still a, a reasonable chance of scoring goals. So if you can allow Jorginho to pass left and right, and uh, occasionally forward, it allows the other attacking five to go and do whatever the hell they want. Pass forward, break lines and score goals. Moving on to our fourth and penultimate point, we're going to talk about Kai Havertz. And has he hit the ground running? Has he taken a bit more time to adapt to English football? Low-key, I feel, I feel like he's low-key been decent the last four games. Everyone's going to say he hasn't hit that 62 million price tag. He hasn't had a lot of those vintage moments. And... Bar the Hudson-Odoi assist and the four, three goals against ba Barnsley that we're not going to talk about too much because he is Barnsley. I think he's looked good on the ball. I think he's just struggled to have those impactful moments that people want to see. But I still think over the long term, he is going to develop. He is going to become that player we want to see from him. We just haven't seen any of those big moments from him yet. Penultimate. Big word. Big words. Go on, man. How many syllables on that? Oh, sure. mate, I'm dyslexic. Don't ask me. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a long word. No, I, I see, I, I, we've said this as a debate. I, I don't necessarily think that he's hit the ground running, but that's fine. That's okay, you know. Mm. I think, you know, the £62 million price tag, it may even be more, who knows, you know, rumoured figures and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, who knows? Anyway, I don't think he's hit the ground running the same way that I liked of a Bambiang necessarily did. You know, someone along those lines. You spend the big money, you know, you, you know what you're getting kind of thing. Um, you know, you look at Ronaldo when he went around Madrid many, many years ago. You know, for now, what's not considered a hell of a lot more money, um, he straight in hit the ground running, you know. But I think I've seen signs of Havertz, and you can definitely see, you know, we're talking the assist for Callum hudson Odoi, the way he drives the ball up the pitch. You can see what he's going to be do, able to do for Chelsea. And I, I don't like this whole comparison thing, you know, where you compare one player to another and call them the next this and the next that. Marco Marin, the next Messi. Well, I still, I'm never going to forget that. Exactly, do you know what I mean? But one thing I will say, and it's not necessarily a comparison, but I would just say there is a hell of a lot of similarities the way that Kai Havertz drives the ball, and I'm going to say a big, big name here, Johan Cruyff used to drive the ball up the pitch. That's that's a big old statement. That's a big old statement. And not, oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm. Johan Cruyff confirmed. <laughs> Let's go. I, I'm not saying that he's going to be the next Cruyff. Do you know what I mean? But what I will say is the way that he drives the ball, the way that he plays, the way that he moves is very, very similar to things like he used to do. And there's so many players that have done it. He's probably the arguably the best one. Um, and I think one of the main points for me is. He is showing little elements. Yes, obviously he got a hat-trick against Barnsley. We know Barnsley. But he's doing it in other games as well. He did it against Palace. He just drives the ball up the pitch. He doesn't necessarily want to do the defensive side of the ball. That's fine. That will change over time. Lampard will be able to implement that. And we'll go on to Lampard in a little minute. Um, but I don't think he's really hit the ground running the same way that, you know, He's not going to go and score 20 goals this season, I don't think. I think he might go and get 10 goals, 15 goals, but I don't think he's going to get 20 goals. You know, he's not going to be Lampard just yet, you know. But it's going to come. It is going to come. And uh, I think when, again, the back four is settled, I've said it this a lot, the defensive stability needs to be there. When you allow him to go forward and run right and do what he does best, that's when you're going to see the best Kai Havertz. And, and, and that's, what, that's the time we've got to wait for. That is the time we've got to wait for. The 60 million quid is for the next 10 years. Isn't it for the next seven years? Unless, I don't know, we want to sell him or whatever for 300 million quid, which, I mean, 300 million quid. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Um, you know, it is for the next few years. Let's enjoy it now. This is the start of the climb. This is the start of the grind. He was the best player for Leverkusen, yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean he's instantly the best player for Chelsea. Leverkusen and Chelsea are very, very different levels. And he's doing well, and he's getting there, and he will get there by probably, I would even say December, I think he will get there. But right now, he's not necessarily hit the ground running as well as he could have potentially done. You know you're in trouble when I've got the microphone. Anyway, point number five. We're going into this. I'm taking this one. We're, talking, we're going to talk about Lampard. We're going to talk about Lampard. Lampard, I feel, something that we've learned this season is that he is definitely as ruthless as we need him to be. The guy is going to be the... 
the guy to take Chelsea forward for many, many years to come. And I think the likes of, I mean, what he's done with Ruben Loftus-Cheek, what he's done with Ross Barkley, even what he was prepared to do with Tamori. Go out on loan. Prove that you can do what you can do. Move people on. You are not part of my plans. Whatever. The Rudiger saga, who knows what's going to happen with that. Only time will tell. But for me, one of the main things I've learned, and I'm really interested to get your opinion, is Lampard is ruthless. Yes, and I want to build on that and say you'd have even more examples of his ruthlessness if we're able to get the valuation fee that we wanted for certain players. I mean, right now we're looking at, right now if we just look at the entire team, we've got three starting left backs. And if we're being brutally honest, Azpilicueta is probably our second choice left back over, those, over Emerson and Alonso. And he ain't going to care about that because, especially with the stuff that happened with Frank Lampard and Alonso after the West Brom game, I can't lie, it's probably finished for Alonso. Emerson... I couldn't really care less. They're both the same quality of left back, in my opinion. Kepa, like, as much as I love Kepa, even with a clean sheet against Portugal, I don't really think we're going to be seeing him much anymore except the Southampton game because now Mendy's injured. But I doubt we're going to see it play much. We've had Lampard show many, many times last season that he doesn't trust him. And now we don't even have to start Willy Caballero to do it. Genuinely, I think Mendy is going to come and he's probably, have, he's probably going to have the most comfortable time assimilating into a new club out of anyone in the transfer window just because of how low the bar's been set. And I think the same thing for Ben Chilwell too. Do you think that Lampard and Marina are going to get on like an absolute house on fire but just about how ruthless they are? Because in Germany I think she's called something like the Iron Lady someone might be able to translate that oh, or whatever. That. I, think, I think it's going to be a great pairing in those two. It is but I love Marina but the one thing I'm going to say is the insistence on getting the perfect price tag it does hold us to a point. I don't mind because we eventually get the money we want. Yeah. Her, her persistence always works off, even in the case of bringing players in and losing players as well. But also, especially with the circumstances of this transfer window, it's kind of held, held us back a little bit because now you've got a massively packed squad. Lampard has to try and keep all of them happy. He's not going to keep all of them happy. We've got five centre-backs, three left-backs, three goalkeepers. So I think striker and midfield is fine because you expect it with the quality there. But everywhere else, you're going to have players that aren't happy. And I think the best thing for Lampard is that we've got two, two and a half months before the January window opens. So it's not too long to try and have to deal with that. But I think Lampard's biggest task is trying to make sure that this doesn't have an impact on team morale. Last season, he did an amazing job of assimilating in the youth and keeping the older players happy. Now he's got to do the same thing with five new signings as well. It's tougher for him. It's not to say he can't do it. But it's just another stepping stone he has to get across. I'm going to ask one last thing as well to you. It is going to be about my favourite player, Mason Mount, the guy that I think is the future captain of Chelsea. I will say that now. Whether you like it or not, I don't care. We're back in the agenda. I think he could even be England captain as well, but that's a different matter. <laughs> so, quite a hard job, Lampard, Mason Mount, and a lot of critics out there. You know, We'll talk about it. There's people on Twitter. We see it every day. People that absolutely hate Mason Mount. Don't, yeah. re don't get why he's not in... Exactly. There's been some you know, horrible posts about him for absolutely no reason. Lampard has got a little bit of a difficult job, obviously, dealing with him. Um, because, you know, I want him in the team. I, I want him in the team every week if I really could. Um, maybe it's not going to be his year as much as it was last year. But he's still the right person to play. Do you think Lampard is dealing really, really well? Because I think he is dealing... That was a really in, bad comment. Inconsiderate, inconsiderate. Um, I, think, I think he's going to be a part of the Chelsea team for the future, but this season, do you think Lampard's got quite a tough task on his hands with being ruthless towards Mason Mount? Because there is times where he is not the right person to play. I think his best position probably is going to be a number eight, but currently where he is at the moment is not going to be in the team this season. I agree with what you're saying, where I don't think he's going to have as much game time as he does last season. But same way with, the, with how congested the fixture list is this season, it kind of works into his favour as well. Also in the case of the youth, I'll, I'll put it, generalise it for the Chelsea youth in general. A lot of people saying they might not be getting the same game time as usual. That is fine, but I think Lampard knows how to manage this because I always take it back to 2003 and I say he's, Mason Mount's in the same position Frank Lampard was in. You've got a bunch of new signings coming in and everyone's saying he's going to be the weak link in the squad. Lampard proved everyone wrong. It's not to say Mason Mount will do the exact same thing, but he will have the opportunity to do it. So 
I'm not too worried. If anything, if we're looking through the whole youth in general, Tamori has seen a decent amount of game time. So has Christensen. Yep. Mason Mount has seen a lot of game time, to the point where half the fan base are getting annoyed about it. But I, I understand why it hasn't worked out well for him. You, he's, the wings isn't really his best position. Yep. You keep him in because he deals with the press. He's a, he's a whole big part of our pressing game, so I get why he plays. But he's had game time as well. Tammy has had game time over Giroud. Um, in midfield, I don't know if I'm missing any... I feel like I'm missing Gilmore, but he's injured. Loftus Cheek already knows gone out on loan. But there's game time around the whole stretch. And with the way this fixture list is going to be for the season, I'm not worried. I think they're all going to get a respective amount of game time. I, th I think he's in a perfect position where he can just come in straight away in any attacking position for the last half hour, That's 20 minutes. Him, yeah. Exactly. And he can do an absolute madness. I think Lampard has been ruthless enough and I think he's going to be understanding enough throughout the rest of the season. But guys, this is the end of the video for you guys today. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of the points we made down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Blues Fans TV. Check out Carefree Lewis G. That's my personal channel and Ian, your channels. Craigo 28 Football, Craigo 28 Sport. And there will be links down in the description below. So if you guys could check that out and just press that like button, we would massively appreciate that. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video and we'll see you for Chelsea v Southampton. Up the Chelsea.